welcome to Revelation Reimagined, an online discussion and exploration of the book of Revelation. What does this prophetic book say about Revelation? What does it say about the end times, the end of the world? What is it all about and how does it speak to our lives today? That is what we are discussing as we go through this 12-part series. With me on the panel, I have Roman Halupka, Peter Hughes and Michael Mahanu, and my name is Darren Croft, and we are four pastors from different parts of Melbourne. Our first session, we introduced the book of Revelation, its background, and we delved into chapter 1. This provided us the backdrop to look into chapters 2 and 3 in our last session where we looked at the seven churches of Revelation and we saw how each message, each church, speaks to us as well as providing an overarching view of history as well as speaking to the people back in John's day when he wrote it. So now we come to Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Imagine the scene where a scroll contains a special message that needs to be read and understood. However, to open this scroll requires special qualifications. Qualification that on first blush it appears that nobody meets. And so today we delve into this backdrop scene of Revelation chapter 4 and 5 that introduces the seven seals that are soon to, to come. And it provides us a context for a better understanding of the seven seals. And so in these chapters, we, we see this bright, shining light that we discover that there is one and only one who is worthy to open the scrolls. So with no further ado, let's talk Revelation 4 and 5. Now on the surface, some think that going through the book of Revelation can be a bit of a dry journey. You know, Revelation 4 and 5, let's just skip these chapters and get into the juicy bits. Why do these chapters matter? I think that what matters really is uh, <coughs> who, who is Jesus and what he is doing now. That's something very important because there is a tendency for many beautiful Christians that they finish with Jesus everything on the cross and they forget that what he's doing now, it matters a lot for our life. Okay, yeah. Peter. Christ was, as we found in chapter 1, the high priest and he was the high priest of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, does his role change when we get to the chapters 4 and 5 and what continues after, or he, is he still central in what is going to occur in these chapters and what happens after? Mm. Okay. Mm. Michael, do you want to <clears throat> Well, I think these chapters are... are very important um, because they take us back. So we know the book of Revelation was written around year 95 at the end of the first century. Uh, so it takes us back to the moment Jesus ascended to heaven. What happened there? Mm. So we know what happened on the earth, that, that uh, the disciples came together in the upper room, they were praying and praying for 10 days, and then the Holy Spirit came. So when we put those events together, it's just amazing because we find in these chapters that Jesus was enthroned, and in that moment the, the Holy Spirit was overpoured on his work on earth mm -hmm. and we know in in the book of acts uh, the the power of the christian church has started to spread the gospel so i guess just putting together uh, side by side these events it just gives us a better understanding not only of what happened on earth but what what was happening in heaven so, so it's almost as if what you're describing is a a coronation scene of jesus as king is that Absolutely. Mm, yeah. That's what we see. No, he's a king. And as a king, he's sending the Holy Spirit to continue the work that he started on earth. So, so are we diminishing the, the triumph of Jesus on the cross at all in this? No. The cross actually made it possible for him to sit again on the throne. Mm. It's just a natural continuation. Without the cross, uh, we couldn't talk about uh, chapters 4 and 5. Mm -hmm. But because of the cross, this is the natural uh, outcome. Jesus received his throne 
in heaven. Okay, so it's bigger insight as to what Jesus is and what he's about. You, right. made, you made the comment, who is worthy? Yeah. It? And this is the answer to that comment. Yeah. So let's, let's go to Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, because this leads us into the book and gives us a bit of context. So Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So what's this verse talking about? It's an invitation to John to join God in the heavenly throne room. The first three chapters were taken here on earth, were, were accomplished on earth. But now he's being taken back into the throne room of heaven. And like Michael said a few moments ago, he is going back to his inauguration on the throne of heaven. Yeah. So he was there in the room, the upper room, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now he's going to see how that happened and who was it that poured it out. Yeah. And what a privilege for us. So what happens in heaven, it's open for us to know. So it's not secretive that, like, you know, we shouldn't know. The humans uh, uh, shouldn't know what's happening in heaven, but we receive the invitation actually to be part of that great inauguration and through John, humanity is present there to see what's happening in heaven. I think it's a privilege. Yeah, I, I, I like those, those opening words, Roman, about the door being open in heaven. Yeah, that's, it gives us, that's, that's what Michael has mentioned yeah. right now, you know, yeah. that, that, you know, it gives us the view what is happening there. And I think that we have to realize there's a whole important process of our salvation. And we have to understand it. It's, it's, it's something that is still on. And so that's the reason we should know about it. All right, let, let's keep reading. So we go into Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to read the passage from verse 2 right through to verse 11. And it says there, At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures gave glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. All right, pretty amazing picture, right? Um, what, are you, what, what, what are you seeing when you try to picture what's going on here? That's a beautiful. We see the throne of God. And and this rainbow over it. 
let's rainbow always comes takes us back to to the first time as as there was not only the word the promise in words but the sh there was a sign of covenant between god and and people there was uh, after the flood and and rainbow still stays with us in such a way as a sign of a covenant so what what the covenant means what, what it means it's just something what we call the whole salvation for us guaranteed from the god side and he's always keeping it how much having such a beautiful sign we are keeping the same yeah good good can i ask who who was who represented by the rainbow who is the covenant giver who, who established that covenant with man the creator the creator so jesus so jesus so yeah. Jesus is present there for sure. The, the rainbow is suggesting that it's He who yeah. is sitting on the throne. All right. Yes. All right. So, so the covenant giver is now the covenant keeper. That's what yes. you're getting at, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all the covenants mentioned in the Bible are always initiated with God. Yes. That's Him. Yes. I just wanted to mention. Um, we are given a glimpse into God's throne. And the beauty there is beyond imagination. So it says, for example, the rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So it's not actually the rainbow, but it's ten times better than that. And, and poor John, he couldn't find words to describe the beauty uh, that is there at the throne. And I, I guess our words are not enough to describe that. So John was just trying his best to, to make the best uh, of the human language to convey the beauty at God's throne. You almost do get the sense that he's struggling to, to convey what he's yeah. seeing, don't you? And, and I don't know about you, it reminds me a bit, you know, in Ezekiel chapter 1, and um, it's an interesting chapter to look at. Ezekiel chapter 1 is this strange, you know, explanation when Ezekiel sees God and by the time he gets to the end of the chapter, he spent the whole chapter trying to, to build up and explain what he saw. And then he says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of of the Lord. He can't come out and say, this is what the Lord looked like. He says, no, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Yeah. And I, I almost get the same sense with John. It's like, it's, it's kind of like this, but better. <laughs> yeah. What about some of the other symbols there? We, we've got these 24 elders. Well, it doesn't sound as a symbol. They're the real elders, the real people sitting there on the thrones. And we can only try to think, you know, who are they? And, and, and we can name only a few what for sure we know they are in heaven. We know about Enoch, we know about uh, Moses, that's in time, and Elijah. Uh, and we know without the name, the group of people, they resurrected also at the moment as Christ was dying on the cross. So that, that's... Just, just pause at that one, because that's not necessarily well known by everyone, is it? Um, yeah, Apostle Paul has mentioned about it in, yeah. in the letter to Ephesians, and he's mentioning, you know, that they were also, as he ascended to heaven, with him he took, you know, also those who resurrected. But uh, well, I ask you a question, Roman. Why elders? Why does the Bible say the symbol of these people mm. was elders? Well, the, the first impression that came to my mind, because, you know, they were so old that time. No, no, that's not the reason. Then they were just the uh, elders, the, one of the, of the leaders in their faith, in their obedience, and they were the people who, who were different from the others. Mm -hmm. yeah. I heard the interpretation uh, that the, the 24 elders can be representatives of, of different other creations of God. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that it attaches the word elders, it doesn't, doesn't lead to that direction. It leads to the fact that these people are connected to the human drama that is unfolding uh, in the next so chapter. The, the elder is a human title, isn't it? It's a human title. They are connected to us. Uh, and the presence there around the throne is meaningful. 
Because everything that happens there is related to Jesus' work as a redeemer, as a sacrifice. Now he's there to be, to be coronated and they are present. And then we connect with Matthew 27 where we are told that the saints, a number of the saints came back to life when Jesus died on the cross. So, so let's give the reference on this one for people who want to check that out. That's Matthew 27 verses 51 to 53. Anyway... Just... Yeah, so we, we connect the dots and the, yeah. the Ephesians, uh, what Apostle Paul said yep. there, and then that leads to the conclusion so that Ephes- this... I'm going to jump in again, Ephesians 4.8, so we just All want to right. make yeah. sure people Ephesians 4, eight. Yes. Up on mm-hmm. those texts. Yeah. So that, that people have a, a strong bond, strong connection with humanity, what's happening here, and actually what is happening in heaven connected to yeah. uh, the earth. Yeah. There's a lot of praising going on with, with these people, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty happy to be where they are. Yeah. Can I make one comment? The word elder, as Michael was saying, suggests humanity. Why humanity? Because God's creation doesn't die. It doesn't age. They are people who, are crea- who were created to live forever. Angels and people like that. So it is only on earth that people age. Yeah. People sort of grow in maturity and mm. become an elder. Mm. So this is suggesting that these people, like you said, can, can can I just twist a little bit the image? Because when we see like artist renditions of of the throne of God, we see these uh, elderly people with white white hair. <laughs> 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 All, right. All right, All right. But actually, I think these people have black hair. All right, so yeah, the title going. elder, it doesn't mean that they are elderly like us, <laughs> like some of us, all right? But uh, it, it's a human title attributed to them because of their human experience. Uh, but actually, they are as young as ever. Yeah, they're not going to die, are they? Yeah. Never to grow old. No, so there's been a transformation take place. Now, Peter, you might want to pick up on, on this one. So this idea that there is two witnesses. Now we've got 12 gates and we've got 24 elders. Yes. Well, in scripture, the condition to prove something is true and accurate has to be supported by at least two or three witnesses. So that if there's 12 gates, could it be possible that each gate will be manned by two elders two witnesses so that when you come to heaven and you're going to enter in one of those 12 gates, they can validate that, yes, you're worthy to come into this place. Yeah, you've been covered with Jesus. Anyway, yes. it's, it's an interesting possibility. We, we just <laughs> wanted to, to not let that one go. Can we talk about the four living creatures? So these are representative um of something obviously but we have the lion the ox the man and the eagle what are they telling us Uh, i think we'll struggle to imagine uh, these four living creatures with four (laughs) four faces faces we we will have uh, at least i struggle to see um, but i don't know how much we look into it as a as a reality or as a symbol but um, definitely there are some connections that can be made there with the na- uh, nature of, of christ mm-hmm. uh, like we are talking about the lion where is, is the royalty we are talking about the ox that is the animal sacrifice and the, is the sacrificial aspect of jesus uh, we are talking about the man the faith of a man that is the incarnation. human nature his incarnation and then the eagle uh, that uh, might represent uh, jesus divine nature as he ascended to heaven in his divine nature so it, it's very interesting that we can correlate this actually to the full ministry of christ and his role in the plan of salvation so this moment we are talking more about symbols, okay, um, yes. because that's I can't yeah. imagine, you know, such <laughs> such yeah. beings. Yeah. Yeah. Try, try getting around yeah. the four faces, yeah. 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 yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because the four creatures were around the throne, it is what doing what Michael was suggesting that these four symbols actually all symbolise Christ and Christ's ministry in heaven and on earth. 
Mm. So, so there's Ooh. there's a bit of what could you say symbolic reality going on here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They're used to justify who it is that John is seeing sitting on the throne. Yeah. Now, we've also got these seven spirits that are mentioned in this passage, and, and that obviously connects us back to the seven stars and the seven candlesticks yeah. and, and the seven angels in chapter 1 and then chapter 2 and 3 with the seven churches. Um, what are the seven spirits? What's that a reference to? Mm. Well, I guess it can be confusion because we are talking about the Holy Spirit as being one person. So is Holy Spirit one person or seven? <laughs> yeah, one, interesting on this one, one of the translations actually uses the word sevenfold spirit, which I don't know whether that adds... All right, yeah, yeah. definitely that adds. Uh, but I wonder if actually seven, because we find the number seven, 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 so many times in the book of Revelation, and every time the seven finishes with the completion, finishes with Christ coming on the clouds of heaven, and uh, the, the drama of history of the earth is finished, and the eternity starts. Uh, so I wonder if Actually, the seven spirits of God is a representation of the perfection, completion of the Holy Spirit, the work that the Holy Spirit does. Uh, and it's something that we can't understand, how the Holy Spirit can be present everywhere in the same time. It's just, it, it, it suggests a work of completion. There's an interesting passage that people might want to check out later in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, where it talks about these, these seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit. And I think it just adds to our understanding that, yes, it's the Holy Spirit, but there's more than one aspect to the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's talk symbolic numbers for a minute, because these numbers, we, we have a whole bunch of numbers. We go from 2 to 3 to 4 to 6 to 7 to 10 to 12 and 144,000. Yeah, we, we, we then <laughs> multiply those numbers oh, yeah. and come up with 666 and 144,000. Um, let's start at the bottom. The number two. Who wants to tell us what that one's about? In the book of Revelation, for sure, two will will point again, as everything, you know, there, to Jesus. And it will, will help us to understand his dual ministry uh -huh. that he has, you know. We already mentioned that he started mm -hmm. to introduce himself as a high priest. So this priestly ministry of Jesus will continue through the book quite a long time until suddenly we have Jesus in a completely different role uh, as, a, as a commander of the God's army, as Michael. Mm. Um, and, you know, and at the same time we can say as king of kings. Mm. So, so that's, that's, you know, he's, uh, that's a dual, dual ministry. Okay. That's what we can see it yeah. here. Yep. Peter, what about this number three in Revelation? Number three in Revelation suggests the, the multiplicity of God. When you, when you use the word God in Scripture, it is in Hebrew rendered most often in the plural. Can, can I jump in there? A plurality of one. A plurality of one, but the one is actually three. There is another word, if you wanted to think about it for a moment, called ekad. Ekad means three, a multiple of numbers, and one of them is significant. Mm. But if you're talking God, that number one is God in three persons. Mm. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. So three in the book of Revelation tends to represent the working of God. Yeah, mm. so it's the triune <clears throat> God... And even in the praise that we were looking at before, you see that the praise often comes in groups of three. Yes. Um, you know, glory and honour and power. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Holy is the yeah. Father, holy is the Son, holy is the Spirit. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. go to the... If, sorry, I, may, right? if I may yeah, just add, you know, to this, because that's very important that people will understand. That's, that's the word that we translate uh, one, a hat, this Hebrew word, it's plural, it's not singular. And, and you know, uh, I was taught by some people from Egypt who, who are using Arabic language. And they said, well, 
one that's obvious that's plural. Hmm. And, and, and I smiled because that's, that's shocking. But you know, especially in connection with the Bible message, we have to remember that whenever it, we are talking about one God, it's yes. plural. I, I, and that's why I threw in the plurality yeah, yeah. of one, and I, that's a good explanation yeah, yeah. and an important one, because what we're saying is the Father is God, yes. Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit is God, God. Yeah. and they are one. And that's this Hebrew word, ehat. Yeah. yeah, and actually when we progress through Revelation, you get a, a counterfeit yeah. of the three. Mm -hmm. You get the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which we'll come to down the track. Mm. Michael, tell us about the number yeah. four. Yeah, so number four uh, comes in the book of Revelation a few times uh, as the four corners or four points of the compass, the four winds of strife, uh, the four streams uh, in, in Eden, uh, the, four, uh, the four speeds of the world. So it's just suggesting universal, something universal that is happening, mm. covering the whole earth. Yeah, yeah. And, and coming back this way, Peter... Do you want to tackle by six and seven in, in one go? Do I want to tap? Well, well Michael covered seven very adequately at, at yeah. the beginning. Seven is the completeness of God. Mm. So, so that it takes us through to rest. Yes. In you, you have a beginning and you come to the end, and that ends in Revelation as described in seven. But in Revelation, if you are talking six, you're talking something a little less than perfect. So six in scripture and in Revelation can be pointing to the counterfeits, the, people, the, the forces that are trying to counterfeit the actions of God. Yeah. And six is an incomplete action. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, Roman, number 10. Well, num number 10, it, it appears also in the Bible quite often, and it's, it's also the, the, the completion. That, that's something that shows about uh, something that is, that is complete, and that's, you know, but, uh, well, what probably for us will be so important, there are Ten Commandments mm. of God, the law of God, that is, that is absolutely perfect, complete, and as somebody said, I still remember this, you know, that we could throw out all the books of lawyers, you know, with laws of different countries. Ten Commandments, they have everything. Mm. So, Life and yeah, property and relationships. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, good. Michael, I'm going to come to you. Number 12. Yeah, number 12, um, we think of 12 um, uh, patriarchs, 12 um um, right. tribes of Israel, uh, 12 disciples, uh, so yeah, there's uh, 12, uh, has 12 uh, gates uh, as we go in the New Jerusalem, so it, it looks like it's a kingdom number. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess what we're saying is, and the reason we spent some time on these numbers, is these numbers have significance they they are as much about qualities as quantities. So when we see the number 12 or a multiple of 12, it's shouting out at us, you know, this is a kingdom number. This is a kingdom of God moment. And, and so watch for it as we go further into Revelation that these numbers do have significance. Let's come to Revelation chapter 5. And in Revelation chapter 5, we'll again read... A, a bit of an extended passage. Let's go Revelation 5, 2 to 4 first. And it says there, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside and then we come to verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Let's again look at the symbols that are being used here. Mm. Who is the lamb? 
Jesus. Jesus, easy answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, absolutely. Um, but we can add some more words, you we're, know. We're actually starting, yes. I'll, I'll let you keep going. We're starting to see a, a consistent theme here. What's the answer? Jesus. Yes. Absolutely. Um, it seems that's to be coming is. through often. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Well, because saying Jesus, I can, we can add, you know, he's our Lord, he's our Saviour, he's our Redeemer, uh, he's a judge also because all the judgment is given to him, uh, and he's God. Yeah. The fact that it's a lamb means that he was sacrificed, yeah. that he shed yeah. his blood. His blood was shed, and it was shed for humanity. Mm. Mm. And that's... <clears throat> What gives him the qualification, mm. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, well, we know that in the old Israel, um, the the royalty and the priesthood, they are two separate entities. They never mingle together. Uh, and God the separation made separation of powers. A bit a like separation that. of powers. Yeah. One was a civil one, was was a religious one, and we know how dangerous actually is to mix the two. Yeah. But here we find in Jesus the two in a very harmonious way because this the lion from the uh, 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 seed of David, from the root of David, and um, that, that is the royalty aspect. And the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament that someone from the tribe of Judah, from, from David, will sit on the throne forever. Yeah. And so that's, that's the side. And the other one is the, the priesthood, the sacrifice aspect. So in Jesus, both of them, in a harmonious way, they come together. Everything together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Let's keep moving. The scroll. What might the scroll be? Well, usually the scroll uh, in those times, there was something very important, the important document. What document? Well, we connect it mostly as a covenant scroll, mm -hmm. which regulates, you know, our relations between God and us. But at the same time, sometimes we, we put scroll, uh, and it is called so that maybe it was this covenant, all there was, uh, there was, uh, Put in one book of of the of the Torah, it means the Deuteronomy. So some people think this. Anyhow, that's so important scroll, so important book that you know that no one is allowed to open it. That that, that creates some problem. But when you talk about Deuteronomy, anyone, what what what's the significance of of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is a retelling of the law of God. Yeah. yeah. It's the law of God written on a scroll. And when when a a Jewish man was going to be elevated to the position of king of Israel, he had to have a copy of that scroll. He had to make a copy of that scroll. And then he had to accept that scroll before they would actually crown him king. Mm. So it was a crown of the law, and he was going to be the teacher of Israel of the law, and he was going to be the keeper of the law. Mm. Yes. Okay. So it's the scroll of the law of God. Yep. And mm. the qualification to be king. Yep. So there are good indications that actually this scroll uh, could have been the book of Deuteronomy, okay. as the new king, Jesus, is coming on the throne. Uh, he is doing exactly as the kings in the old Israel were doing. Uh, he needed to take the scroll to make the scroll his. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a good indication that, that that is the typology that is used here. But in the same time, it might be, and probably we have to be opened to different other okay. uh, options. It can, it can be a new scroll altogether, mm -hmm. all right? A scroll that starts to be undone because it's sealed with seven seals. Mm. Uh, and we're going to go into the seals uh, next time. So as every seal opens, something it happens. And that is suggesting some somehow... Uh, the prophetic history of the nations mm -hmm. uh, and the church, uh, 
uh, or it contains the history of God's providences. So through the historicist um, lens, we can we can see that God has been present in the history of humanity from Christ up to now, and we can follow that presence of His providence through the history. Yeah, and of course, there's there's links there to Daniel too. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say, that, that you know, there is a book of Daniel that was sealed. There was, God asked him the, through the angel, said, seal the book, don't, don't ask anymore, mm. you know. And now we are talking about unsealing, but you know, of course we don't find in the book of Daniel seven seals. But, but you know, that's, that's, that's only connection there. symbolic, but, you but know. That's, yeah, yeah, yes, and, and yeah, it's a connection. Yes, absolutely. Revelation, yeah. by contrast to Daniel, is given to read and to understand. Yeah. Daniel yeah. is sealed up. So yes, yes. There's, there's an interesting connection there. So, so there's there's a number of possibilities, all of which can add to our understanding of what's going on. Is that a fair a fair comment? Mm. Right. And I, I think we have to admit the fact that there might be things in the book of Revelation that we, we still need to understand. We shouldn't claim that, yeah, now we understand everything, thank you very much. We know that we've been struggling for, for a long time to understand what this scroll is all about. And now we, we started to, to uh, have a little bit of understanding. And, and maybe, Peter, you'd like to talk about uh, Isaiah, the connection with the uh, sealing of the, the scroll there. So there is another connection there. In chapter 8 verse 16 of Isaiah, Isaiah was given a direction by God and he said, bind up the testimony, bind up the scroll. But then he continued with his statement with a second and seal my disciples. So you would, he, he was to bind the scroll and yet God would then seal his disciples. So the sealing of the scroll meant that the covenant relationship with God had been suspended for the nation of Israel. But when he said, seal the law among my disciples, I'll give you the full quote, he was saying the nation with the suspension of the, the, the scroll and the covenant with the nation has occurred, but if you are a believer in God, and you have the love of God in your heart, the Holy Spirit was going to seal that law in your heart so that you would continue with that. Mm. So you've got the law for the nation of Israel is suspended, but if you are a believer in Christ and in God, you will be sealed with that love and that law. Mm. So, so what you get here is a real sense that there is a richness to the, the imagery and the symbolism that is used here. And, and each of these angles adds a depth to our understanding of what's going on and a depth to our understanding of, of who Jesus is. And we could, we could talk about all, this all day, but we need to, to keep moving. I want you to come to the praise sections of Revelation 4 and 5, because there are these series of praise to God from... Um, yeah, from different angles, what does this reveal to us about Jesus? You're the best one to answer this, Darren. <laughs> yeah, keep... <laughs> you, you want to put me on the spot, don't you? <laughs> uh, You're the one that actually noticed it. <laughs> well, uh, as with many good ideas, I'm sure that um, somebody noticed it before I did. But um, I guess as you look, look through, so Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, um, you see the eternal aspect of God, you know, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's the, the great I am, Peter, yeah. which we might get to pick up on again at some point. Uh, Revelation 4.11, for you created all things. You know, he is God eternal. He is God creator. Revelation 5 verse 9, for you were slain and with your blood you ransomed or you purchased people. He is redeemer God and then by the time you hit Revelation 5 verse 11 and 12 worthy is the lamb power wealth this is a sevenfold praise talking about sevens power wealth wisdom strength honor glory and praise belong to him you know he is king and then by the time you get to Revelation 5 13 
praise, honour, glory, power forever and ever. He is eternal God. And these are all qualities of Jesus that are on display here. And that's why these chapters had so much and why we don't want to just skip over them because it actually helps us when we continue our reading into even more complex things. So let's come to the the key question. Why is the Lamb the only one that can open the scroll? We are always dealing with salvation all the time. So he's the only one who guaranteed Jesus, the Lamb, is the only one, and it's he. He is worthy to do it. Mm. You, you mentioned these characteristics of him, so so that's nothing to be added. You know, that's he is the only one who can who can do it. Who can open it because he knows, and he he knows who to save. He saved us. He did it. So he wants to to do everything for us. Yeah, Michael. But he's unique. Uh-huh. So it's interesting that he is this tension that is created where they're looking for someone in the whole universe and just imagine yeah. there is no equal in the whole universe mm-hmm. to the Jesus so yes. that makes Jesus uh, unique in the work that he did yeah. uh, and in the fact that there's no no one else and it's interesting that there is a moment of suspense where they're looking for someone looking for someone and John realizes that that we are in trouble Mm. We are in trouble, and he starts crying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wept and, and wept. Yeah, he yeah. starts crying because he realized that that tension and how important it was for the salvation of humanity mm. that that person was going to be found. And then, and then he hears the voice. It is the lion from the tribe of Judah? And then when he looks, he doesn't see, he doesn't see a lion. Like he sees a lamb. He sees yeah. a lamb. Yeah. So the, the beauty of that imagery uh, is just amazing. And it, emphasize, it emphasizes the cross. What Jesus did on the cross, where actually when he died on the cross, he didn't, he didn't die as a loser. He didn't die because he lost the battle, but he died because he won the battle for us. But by, by choosing to die, because it was a choice, he actually disarms the, the power of evil. Yes. It is finished. Yeah. Everything was done in that moment. Yeah. And our salvation was sealed in that very moment. So we can have the, the certainty that through Jesus' sacrifice, through the Lamb that was slain, we have a chance to eternal life. Yeah. How beautiful is that? You, you think about this for a moment. I mean, the very act of laying down His power gave Him power. It's, 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 it's ironic. It's a contradiction. It is. Peter. <laughs> Well, Adam and Eve, humanity, succumbed to sin and made Satan the ruler over this world. But it took a man to redeem that lost power. So he's the new Adam. He's the new Adam because without, prior to the cross, there was no one worthy. Yeah. But when you came to the cross and to Christ dying and having his blood shed, it gave him victory over Satan. Yes. And it brought an end to the rule of Satan on the earth. Yeah. So he is the second Adam. Let's, let's read the text that we haven't read yet. And this is Revelation 5 verse 9 before I come back to you for your final thoughts. So Revelation 5 verse 9, the, the yeah, magnificent text. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's, I think, the highlight verse of the... It these nails it. It nails it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, gentlemen, let me give you the, the, the last word. What's your last word on Revelation 4 and 5? What's the big message that you see emerge from here? Who wants to go first? I can start. Go, Michael. <laughs> oh, just the, the, that confidence, the hope that we have, because our representative, Jesus, is on the throne of the universe. And he calls us brothers and sisters. He calls us uh, as sons and daughters. So how do I feel when I know that my father, <laughs> you know, Jesus, 
is actually on the throne of the universe. It, it's so comforting and it, it helps us in through the difficult moments that we go through life. It gives us a lot of hope that things, even if they, they look bad at the moment, definitely they will be brilliant, bright in the future. Yeah, good. It defines the love of God. This, the, these two chapters define the love of God. In the last two chapters, we were talking about the loss of the love of God in people's hearts and the process that was necessary to go through to come back to having that love. This is explaining the love of God for all humanity. For those who have failed and lost their love, he died for them and for us so that we could comprehend the magnitude of that glory of love written in your heart by God. Yeah, beautiful. I, and, and you get that in that Revelation 5.9, it's for every tribe, language, people and nation. This is not just yeah. for the church, this is for everyone. Roman? That's the invitation. Fantastic invitation to you. Uh, I quite often think, you know, my father passed away as I was three months old. I never had anybody to call for the father. Mm. And suddenly, through Jesus, I have the access to the throne of God. I can, I can just be with them uh, and I can feel his presence. What a privilege, what a privilege. And that's, and that's just the beginning of a story, you know, of, of everything, you know, as I learned there. And that's something which I always try to encourage everyone. Accept the invitation, come to him and be with him always. Yeah, and I think for me, the message of, of these two chapters is that Jesus is the only yeah. and the best and come back to only again. He is the only foundation which is worth building my life on. And, you know, he is worthy. And I like the way C.S. Lewis talks about, you know, and he uses in, in the Narnia series the, the image of the lion. Mm. And... Is he, how does he put it? But basically he says, you know, he's definitely not a tame lion. And I think with Jesus, you see that too. He's not this tame God that we can put in a box. He's bigger and better and more magnificent, but in him we can be secure. Mm. Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you for this amazing picture of Jesus that you have revealed to us in this book of Revelation. And we pray that as we contemplate what's written here, the praises that are given to you, that we would find for ourselves the Jesus who is the lamb, the lion, the priest, the sacrifice, the king, our judge, all those things that he is all sufficient for anything and everything we would ever face. And may we get to know him better, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now next week, I say next week, but it might be whenever you watch it next, when you come back next time, we will dig into the seven seals of Revelation. And what we find in those seven seals is there are two really critical questions. That's all I'll say about them this time, but have a read of Revelation 6 to 8 before we gather next time. See you next time.